Well, let's go to 1 Samuel, if you would, please. If you need a, uh, a bulletin or a, a, song, a sheet, I think all of our ushers are gone, so I probably can not be able to get it to you. But if you did come in, you really want one. If you'll hold your hand up, I, there are a few ushers that can get that to you. There is a sheet that was available when you came in. So I think if you need that, hold your hand up, wave it. I'm sure they can help you with that. Anybody didn't get one? Back over here to my right there, guys. Thank you very much. There's some over here to my left as well. Thank you, Brother Richard. I appreciate that. I'm sorry. Should have probably done it early in the service. But um, the worksheet tonight is in the book of 1 Samuel. This is real quickly. Let's just talk about a few things. And we've been going through the books of the Bible and survey. We'll go for a while. We may stop in a little bit. We, in a couple weeks, we have Brother Rick Finley preaching for us on a Wednesday night. But we're going through each book of the Bible and just kind of flying over the top of it and doing a little bit of a survey. There's no way we can get to the nitty-gritty. There's so many things. The book of 1 Samuel has 31 chapters, and I've had the joy to read it and go through it in preparation for this a couple times, but uh, just trying to pull out a few things that can be helpful and give you a uh, bird's-eye view of the Bible that you hold in your hands. Uh, Genesis tells us how God started two races, the human race with Adam and Eve and the Hebrew race with Abraham and Sarah. At the end of Genesis, there are 70 Hebrew people that live now with their brother Joseph in Egypt. 400 years they stay there, and then God delivers them out of the hand of Pharaoh, who has made them slaves. Pharaoh, a type of Satan. Egypt, a type of the world. And they need a deliverer. They cry out to God for help. He sends Moses, a type of Christ, in the way. And he uh, escorts them and allows them to exit out of Egypt. And there we have the book of Exodus. It is how God got his people out of Egypt. The next book is the book of Leviticus, and the book of Leviticus is instructions on God's word and his ways, how to practice things in God's way. And uh, that is really given to the Levites, and that's why we call it Leviticus, is given to the leaders of God's people that were given the responsibility to teach God's word and his ways to the people. And as Exodus got, shows us how God got his people out of Egypt, Leviticus shows how God got Egypt out of his people through the word of God. The book of Numbers tells us the wonderings and the complaining of God's people for 40 years. It chronicles what God's people did for 40 years, going around in circles in the, uh, the uh, Sinai region there, waiting to go into the promised land. In the book of Numbers, they had a chance to go in. They refused by faith. And uh, God says, well, that's fine. You're going to die in the wilderness. I'll let another generation come in. And to prepare that next generation, he gave them the book of Deuteronomy, the book of remembrance. And he stopped them and he said, look, here's the things you're going to need to remember and know before you go in. So he retaught the Ten Commandments that they were just little children or weren't even born when they were first given to them. And gives them the book of Deuteronomy to prepare them for, for the new life that they'll have in Canaan land with a new leader, Joshua. And then the book of Joshua is the land, of, it's the book of conquest. And it shows how God's people left the Sinai region and went across Jordan into Israel and how God divided the different tribes and different, different lands and what God gave them and how he led Mo, or Joshua to lead them. And they had 10, uh, ten different uh, kinds of people that they had to defeat, the Amorites and the Hittite and the otherite brothers and all of those guys all through the Canaan region. Then the book of Judges, they settled down and they had issues. And one of the things they didn't do in Joshua well, they did not thoroughly drive out the enemies of God. They played with sin. They allowed certain things to still come to, to, to remain there. And uh, as a result of that, they began to get afflicted by those people. And it teaches if we play with sin, sin will eventually play with us. And uh, you can't handle sin, I can't handle sin, and the way to go with sin is go for the juggler, deal with it, and get rid of it, flee fornication, run, keep thyself pure, don't play with sin. If you got someone you're texting you shouldn't text, stop, quit. You got a friend that's, that's causing you uh, some problems, and you may, be, you may be six years old or 60, friends can still be bad and influences on our hearts and lives. Uh, break it off, deal with it quickly. And if you don't do that, it's going to complicate your life and your future and your children. In the book of Judges, one of the most frustrating books of the Bible, 
Because the people of Israel got into all kinds of problems and then they would get enslaved to the Midianites and get enslaved to different groups, the Philistines and that kind of thing. They'd cry out and God would send them a, a judge. And 13 judges in, ta- in all, and really, the book we're studying tonight, the book of 1 Samuel, is a continuation. It takes place in the last part of the book of Judges, or the history of God's people. They had 111 years of captivity, 289 years of freedom, but the 111 years of captivity and torture were brutal on them and their people. Now we come to the book of 1 Samuel, and these are books of history. You find your Old Testament is given in books of law, Genesis through Deuteronomy, books of history, which is Joshua through Ezra and uh, Nehemiah and Esther, and then you have the books of poetry, which begin with Psalms, excuse me, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, then you have the major prophets because they're larger books in general, and then you have the minor prophets, smaller books of the Bible. We're now going, we're in the part of history. Joshua started history, Judges started the history. And by the way, the history of the Jewish people should be very important to Christians. You need to love Israel, you need to love Jewish people, and it's very important. We live in a world where there's a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism against the Jewish people. And it's satanic in nature, and it needs to be dealt with in that way. A Christian should love the Jewish people. You got two things from the Jewish people. Number one, you got the scriptures. Number two, you got a savior, both through the Jewish line. And no wonder why uh, of all the nations of the world, and God has Israel very much in line, the seven years of tribulation that will take place after the, um, the, the rapture. That revolves heavily around Israel. That little country the size of New Jersey is almost on every newspaper, almost on every newscast. It's a very small country surrounded by 13 Muslim countries and many times more the people uh, that threaten them on a daily basis. And yet there's something special about that country because they're God's people. They have now, in World War I, God gave them their property were after World War I. After World War II, God gave them their, their, their body in, in World War I. They gave them their soul, their will change. In World War I, not a one Jew had any too much interest in going back to Jerusalem, going back to Israel because it was uninhabited. It was inhabited by just uh, nomads who were just raising their sheep there. It was barren. And they had plus jobs, and they had good businesses all over Europe and Austria and Germany and Russia and those places. So they didn't want to leave those homes. They didn't want to leave the plush and start all over again in Israel. But one thing changed that. World War II and the Holocaust changed that. It changed their ideas and their thoughts to go back to the land of Israel. And however, their spirit has not yet changed as a whole. Uh, their, their body is Israel, their soul, their soul of the people, they, they love their country, they move back to their country, they live there, they'll defend it, but their spirit has not come alive to accept their Messiah as a general rule. There are Jews that do get saved. I had the, I've had the joy to lead several Jews to Christ, see them get baptized and, and grow in the Lord, but, um, but they're, they're not necessarily very receptive at this time. I believe they will be receptive after the rapture of Jesus Christ. When Jesus comes, I do believe almost everything that happens is going to, is going to revolve around the nation of Israel. And even in the middle of the, uh, the tribulation period, the, the, uh, the abomination, desolation, abomination, those situations taking place in the middle of the, of the temple there in Jerusalem, a lot of things that's going to be a very hot spot. Uh, even today, Putin and, and uh, many of the leaders of that area are very interested in getting uh, to that, that country. Uh, Israel today, I heard recently that they supply as much as 70 to 80% of European citrus fruit. It's a place that was barren at one time. Now it is very, very plentiful. It's very, they're very wise. God's given them wisdom, given them a lot of inertia, a lot of finances that comes out of that little country right there, while the other countries and many around them, they have much larger pieces of property, but they have a lot less productivity than God has given his people in that country. So, but uh, the history of Israel is very important. 
I have found in witnessing to Jewish people that most of them are more ignorant of, of the Bible than I am and that you would be. They probably don't have an understanding. They know a little bit more about the Talmud. They know about, more about the teachings of the rabbi. But a lot of times they're not very well versed on their, their history. And uh, from, from uh, they're just not being taught that, or that's not something that they, they're familiar with. A lot of times they don't even know why they do what they do. It's just part of their traditions. And I was thinking about that today in Colossians chapter 2, where the Apostle Paul told the people, he said, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophies, through vain deceit, through the traditions of men, through the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. And uh, we've got to be careful even in our, own, in our own circles. Be careful about traditions and philosophies and rudiments of the world and not focus on the person of Jesus Christ. But the book of 1 Samuel is a great book of the Bible, 31 chapters in all and very, very interesting reading. It revolves around three main men, and uh, one is Samuel, one is, uh, is uh, actually you could say four, Eli is the first few pages, Samuel. Uh, then Saul, and then David. And uh, we'll look at that real quickly. If you would, please, uh, the, the, take your Bibles and turn to 1 Samuel chapter number 8. If you would, look at verse number 5. Thank you for having your Bibles. Thank you for being interested on a Wednesday night to study the Scripture together. The little subtitle I've given you on this is, The People Demand a King. They want a king. God made Israel to be a theocracy. That means that God would be their king. He would be their supreme one, and he would rule them through his leaders. Well, they started looking around and finding other countries of the world, and they had kings, and they didn't, and it really started bothering them. And this is one of the things that every one of us have to be careful about. This world is not our home. We're just passing through. You don't want to find yourself enamored with this world. The Bible says, if we are adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is, an enmity, of, is, is enmity against God. Whosoever should be a friend of the world is an enemy of God. Now, we, have, we live in a world, but God wants to be very distinctively different in how we think, how we conduct ourselves, how we operate. And doesn't mean you have to be uh, a weird, but you will sometimes be viewed that way in, in how you think about things and how you conduct yourself. The Bible tells us, be not conformed to this world, um, but be transformed by the renewing of your, didn't say your body, it could have said that, but it didn't say your dress code, it said your mind, that you may prove what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. But chapter 8 and verse number 5, look at it with me if you would please. This is a verse that some would call the key verse. It kind of demonstrates what they're doing. And uh, let's real quickly look at, at verse number 1. As well, and it came to pass that Samuel was old, and he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of the firstborn was Joel, and the name of the secondborn was Abiah, and, and uh, they were judges in Beersheba. And his sons walked not in his ways, and, but turned aside after lucre, or they, they started looking for money and took bribes and perverted judgment. And all the elders of Israel gathered themselves together and came to Samuel and Ramah. And he and said unto him, Behold, thou art old, and thy sons walk not in thy ways. He used that as an excuse, except, here's what they said. Read it with me. Now make us a king to judge us. Let us have a king that would judge us like all other nations. Verse number 6. And the thing displeased Samuel and when, he, when they said, Give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed unto the Lord. And the Lord said unto Samuel, Hearken unto the voice of the people in all that, thou, that they say unto thee. For they have not rejected thee, but they have rejected me, and uh, that I should not reign over them. He said, they're trying to get rid of God. And ever since uh, the beginning of time, people have been trying to get rid of God. In our nation, getting rid of the Bible. You, can, you have no problem walking on any of our high school campuses with a, um, with a Quran. They don't care. They don't really care if you walk on the campus with Buddhist readings. But you take a Bible on the campus and you're going to get some looks and may even get stopped. Because that's going to be some problems for you. This book, the truth of God and, and God himself and, and Jehovah is one who is not welcome in this world as we know it. And that's why he said friendship with the world is enmity with God. Here's the outline of the book real quickly. I'll give it to you. Number one is the failure of the priestly office of Eli. The failure of the priestly office of Eli, 
And if you read verses one and chapters one and two, you will see that this priest of Eli uh, is very derelict. He's derelict. He has he has problems with his control. He has problems with his two boys. And uh, Hopni and Phineas, both of them, very derelict, very wicked, very perverse men. He knows what they're doing. He doesn't deal with them. And we'll learn a few lessons about parenting opposite of, of him. He was the father nobody would want, Eli. And it's interesting to me that God allowed Samuel to be raised in the same home with a derelict father like Eli, who already demonstrated tremendous um, uh, irresponsibility in raising two other boys. But we see the failure of the priest office in Eli, chapters 1 and 2. Chapters 3 and through 7, we find the formation of the prophetic office of Samuel. Now, God, God takes, he's still, there's a failure of the priest, and really Samuel was probably the 13th judge, but he also became a seer or a prophet, someone who would communicate to God's people. We see a formation of prophets. Up to this time, you could, you could call uh, Abraham a prophet or Jacob a prophet or, or, or Moses a prophet, but primarily, you see the formation of the prophetic, and from here on, you're going to find numbers of prophets like Elijah and Elisha and others of, that you'll see throughout the Bible. Then we find the, the third outline here is the founding of the princely office, and this is Saul and David. Chapters 8 through 31 is the, um, is the founding or the institution of the king's office or the princely office of Saul and David. Here's a couple things. Chapters 8 through 15 shows the tragedy of Saul. Saul was a man who had it all going on in his early days, very humble, very submissive, and yet as he got on, he became someone who was permissive and he was also presumptuous, continually to push the Lord. And God, he would not completely obey God. That's where you hear, and the book of 1 Samuel has a tremendous amount of things. If I started uh, many verses, you would hear that. You would remember these verses, things like, that uh, rebellion is a sin of 1 Samuel, okay? Stubbornness or idolatry like in the stubbornness. There we find that. We see that the all the earth may know. Is there not a cause? That would be out of 1 Samuel. Other verses of Scripture that uh, David encouraged himself in the Lord. 1 Samuel comes up. And so there's a tremendous amount of, of wonderful stories and truths in the book of 1 Samuel. But, uh, but first, you start off with a young man. They said, give us a king. And then God sent uh, Saul to, uh, to Samuel. And Samuel to Saul, he anointed him. He became the first king. He was from the tribe of Benjamin. And uh, he was a, uh, a young man looking for donkeys whenever God uh, stopped him. And uh, the donkeys got found by somebody else. But God found him and made him the first king of Israel. Did pretty well until rebellion and idolatry and stubbornness tackled him and uh, then took him, took him away and lifted the hand of God and the Spirit of God off his life. Probably one of the most terrible feelings is to be a child of God when you cannot feel God's presence upon your life. You feel like that God, he never leaves you. But in the Old Testament, of course, the difference between Saul and David and you is if you're saved, the Spirit of God lives inside of you. In the Old Testament, he kind of rested upon you. It was a little bit different scenario there. And, uh, and Saul found out that he traded rebellion and stubbornness for the presence of God upon his life. And it's a tragic story in so many ways. It just doesn't even make sense. And by the way, a man or a woman in a sinful activity, in a sinful lifestyle, is, is stupid on, on another level. You lack discernment, you cannot make decisions, you hurt yourself, you hurt those around you, you make bad decisions with finances, you make fi usually goes into immorality, is what happens oftentimes. So you want to make sure you have the presence of God upon your life, and Saul is typical. And you can do a study on this, uh, evaluate the spirit of Saul after he, 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 has, he has this rebellious moment where he does not obey the Lord. God takes his hand upon him, and you watch the spirit of Saul, and you, you'll be discouraged about doing that to yourself, for sure, or those around you. Then we find the training of David. 
Most of the book from chapter 16 to 31 chronicles David's life. Now Saul is still involved uh, up to the, almost the end there. He's still, he's still present, but he now has become more of a someone who is chasing David, nervous about David. The Bible says he's afraid of David because he knew the Lord was with him and he wasn't with him. So he attempted to kill David. He threw javelins at him. He chased him like a dog in the woods trying to find him. And he chased him here and there. And yet uh, David had divine protection, but went through some very difficult times, very challenging times. But David, you can see in chapter 16 to 31, there are three uh, areas in which you see David. First of all, in, in your notes there, he learned to love God as a shepherd in solitude. He learned to love God as a shepherd in solitude. So many of the wonderful, if you, could, if you could just read with me or think about this particular, the Lord is my... He probably no doubt thought about that while he's in solitude watching sheep. Okay? And so he had, he had some times in which he, he, he learned to love God while he was by himself, while his older brothers were out and away. His dad and mom sent him out to watch some sheep. There he learned... Solitude. Now, today, we have a hard time with solitude. Most of us, when we get in the car this afternoon to go home or tonight, or whenever we, do, we dismiss from here, midnight or so, uh, you're going to probably, one of the first things we we'll oftentimes do is just turn on the radio, turn on the tape, turn on something. We're not used to sitting by ourselves. We get home, one of the first things people do, turn on the lights, find the remote control, tick, click it on, get something, get some noise going. We're not good at solitude, and yet solitude is very important for the child of God. Sitting and thinking. I think about Isaac when he was coming, when, when, when he was waiting for Rebekah to come. The Bible says he meditated in quiet in the field. It's something we don't do today. We, we're, we're, we're just, we're, we're inundated with noise. You go to a restaurant, you're going to hear music. You go to some fast food, you hear faster music. Get up, get up quickly, get going. Get someone else in here. Uh, you, you'll find, you'll, you'll find it, is, it is lots of noise out there. But he learned to love God in solitude. Number two, he learned to lord himself as a courtier. And he learned to lord himself. He had to deal with him. And here he was escorted into, uh, into Saul's court. Saul now, the Spirit of God is off Saul, and so he's bipolar in his actions. He's real happy sometimes. He's real sad in other times. His sadness and his depression caused his subjects to find someone who would play music that would solve his, 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 his pain and help him give him some peace. And the Lord sent David to do that. David came, and, but he was in confusion. He learned the Lord over himself in times of confusion and understanding who is this guy that, that gets mad at me and he likes me to play. And then once in a while he takes a javelin, throws it over him while I'm trying to play my, my guitar for him. What in the world? He gets, he gets the opportunity to get to know his son, uh, Jonathan. And they had a very special relationship. God gave them, gave him a good friend. By the way, thank God for good friends. Don't you appreciate a good friend? The Bible tells us uh, a friend that sticks closer than a brother. I thought about this. I heard this joke the other day, and the guy said, after you get 40 years old, food starts getting spiritual. It starts sticking closer than a brother. <laughs> you know, and I, I think that's probably true. But I'm thankful for good friends in Christianity that love us and spend time with us and help us through difficult times. And then we find the third area is that he learned to lead men as a fugitive. And there was very, very stressful times. As a teenager, most likely, he was anointed. He was anointed three times, but his first time, whenever, you remember, you remember the story how that uh, Samuel went out to, to, to the farm of Jesse and, and uh, he took Eliab and all the other brothers and, man, don't you have any other brothers? God's telling me no on all of these. Said, yeah, we got one more kid that he's out watching sheep. I'm not going to sit down until he comes. He comes, he anoints him with oil. And, of course, oil is, is not medicinal, it is a type of recognizing that the person who has oil on them needs God. That's why whenever someone is sick and they call for the elders of the church to pray over them, anointing them with oil. And what we do is recognize the person 
who has oil is going to need God's help. And the same was prayed to a priest in the, in the Old Testament. Aaron, you remember they might just talk about in Psalms 133 where it talks about unity, how beautiful it is. It's like, it's like the oil that ran down upon Aaron's beard. It, it covered him completely. And it was a type of the fact that the priest would need God's help. The king would need God's help. Someone who is sick needs the help of God, and that's the, that's the symbolic part of that. He was anointed a king, but he didn't become king for a long time. And he was a head-scratching, stressful time as he was chased for years. While he was chased, he found men who were discontented, who were in debt, who were struggling, and they rallied to David, and he learned how to lead men in, um, in, in, as a fugitive and through very stressful times. Uh, if you might remember some of the stressful times, he, he acted like he was a crazy man, like he was out of, out of his mind, scribbling on a door, of a, of, a, of a city and, and, and drooling and, and uh, acting like he was crazy, so stressed out, so confused, and trying to deal with his enemies. His enemies actually liked him more than his own countrymen and, his, and just a very difficult time. But he learned to lead men in that way. He learned to lord over himself, and he learned to love God. Those are three things very good. Real quickly, the lessons we'll share with you, and uh, I'll quickly give this to you. Godly parents... Uh, godly parenting requires, and when it, I just took really seven things that Eli did not do that we need to do differently. And Eli was the father that nobody would like and, and nobody would want. But if you're raising children, here are just a couple things I think that we can learn from. If you would please look at number one, a positive and merciful spirit. Would you look at chapter one of, of Samuel, if you would please? Samuel chapter, 1 Samuel chapter 1, and verse number 14, I want you to notice, first of all, uh, Hannah, which is Samuel's mother, comes, Elkanah comes, and, and Finna comes, that's, uh, Elkanah has uh, two wives, he has uh, Finna, Finna, and he has uh, Hannah, Finna has babies, Hannah is barren. And Hannah, Hannah spends her time at the temple, and she is kneeling down, and she's praying, and she's not saying anything verbally, but while she's praying, her mouth is moving, and there um, the priest or the preacher comes up, and here's what he says to her as he sees her praying uh, and, uh, and not making any noise, but sees her mouth moving. Look what he said in verse number 14. And Eli said unto her, How long wilt thou be drunken? Put away thy wine from thee. And Hannah answered, No, my Lord, I, I'm... Uh, a woman of a sorrowful spirit, I have, I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but have poured out my soul before the Lord. It's interesting there. I think if you and I are going to be parents we ought to be, we've got to be very careful to guard ourselves of a critical spirit. Critical comments within our own house. This morning I read with the staff and we read together Psalm 101. I will walk within my house with a perfect heart. One of the things that really hurt children is when they see mom and dad different at church than they are in their house. You're going to be different. You're going to, be, you're going to obviously be, be a little bit more relaxed in your own home. But I'm talking about criticism. I'm talking about negative spirit. I'm talking about complaining, giving your opinion about people, about sermons, about Sunday school lessons, about attitudes. A lot of those things would be very, very foolish and will hurt her children. And here at Eli, you can just see inside of him, here's a girl that's broken heart. He said, but why don't you quit getting, coming here drunk? That was his first thought, is that she was drunk. Thought negatively. And she had to say, no, my Lord, I'm not drunk. I'm, I'm broken hearted. I'm giving out my complaint to the Lord. I'm asking the Lord to help me. Number two, obvious love. Obvious love. I won't give the verse on that, but it just I think... Uh, I heard this years ago, a man named Ken McCoy came, and he gave us this thought, and it's helped me a little bit in parenting. Still got a long ways to go. We have a seven-year-old at home and a lot of lessons to learn for young adults. But three things are very important in parenting and three elements. Number one, affection. Number two, direction. Number three, correction. Affection, direction, correction. And I think probably the first is one that is probably 50% or more of child rearing is convincing your child that they're important to you, that you love them. And it's one of the greatest leverage, leverage that God gives to us, but 
con continuing to convey love to your children. Some of your children do not accept love the same way as other children. If you have multiple children, some, they, they, they receive love verbally. They need that affirmation. Some are more kinetic. They need you to tassel their hair, hold them to yourself. Every child is different. And learning to give that affection is so important. By the way, let all of our things be done with charity. We need the Lord's help to love properly. But affection. Number two is direction. I think this is, the, this is second in only to affection. And I think you have, to, you have to learn to give direction to your children. They need that. But if you and I do not love our children, they don't want to hear what we have to say. If people don't trust you, they won't trust what you tell them. And they don't care how much you know till they know how much you care. But that's where love has to be a, a priority in our home, then direction, and then lastly, correction. I find when we have heavy, heavy on the love, heavy on the instruction and the direction, then you also be very, you won't have as much correction to do. They'll be, they'll, their love will cause them to be more receptive, more responsive, and does, every child needs correction. The Bible says foolish is bound up in the heart of a child. Uh, and, and, but the rod of correction will drive it far from it. There needs to be correction. And if you don't correct your own child, you hate your son, the Bible says. But whoso loveth his son, cares for him be time. He, he teaches him early on and deals with him from the beginning. Number three is give them attention. Chapter 2, verse number 12. And we're just about done here. Let me continue and I'll, and I'll close out. Once you notice what the Bible says, now the sons of Eli were sons of Belial, and they knew not the Lord. Here they were raised in a preacher's family, raised in a priest's house, and they were not instructed spiritually, did not even know the Lord. Then I want you to notice chapter 3, verse 13. And it says here about, about Eli, For I have told him that I will judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he did what? He did not deal with them. Every parent has to be wise enough and courageous enough to confront wrong. Confront it and deal with that. We cannot be afraid of our children that we need to help them. Lovingly help them and learn to confront them. And then I will say number, number letter E, they must provide an example. Godly parenting re re requires an example. Letter F, right priorities. Chapter 2, verse 29, you'll see here that, um, that God tells us about uh, Eli in chapter, tw chapter 2, verse 29, and it says, Wherefore, kick ye at my sacrifice and mine offerings, which I have commanded in thy habitation. Honorest thy sons above me. And you make yourself fat with the chiefest of all the offerings of Israel, my people. He said, you honored your kids above me. Now, let me just remind you, moms and dads, those kids are not your kids. They belong to the Lord. And God has got to be number one, your wife, your husband, number two, and the kids, number three, but you must give attention. We're talking about that. But he says, when you chose your kids above me, occasionally we find this in Christianity where people, when their kids start compromising, mom and dad make the compromise with them. It's a challenge. I heard for them because they grieve. They want to go to church with their grandkids, but now their grandkids are going to churches they can't in good conscience go to. It's, it changes things. There's, there's doctrinal issues. There's priorities and problems. And now you have to make a choice. And he said, look, your kids did wrong, and you still went with your kids and forgot about me. God said that, that's a problem. Then we find um, that uh, the, he did not walk with God. The word of the Lord was precious in those days. The last thing, be patient through God's process of training. David's training was long and arduous and difficult and challenging. And I don't know about you, but we like instant stuff, don't we? We like a drive through there's no one in front of you. You like to be able to get what you want right away, hurry up. But that's not the way God works. God is sometimes slow, but he's never late. And God's, some of his favorite tools of training is delay. He makes us wait on him. And while we're waiting, it's like the little, the, the little cocoon situation. What happens if you help, a, uh, you help a butterfly out of a cocoon by splitting it open and help him get out quicker? What happens? They don't fly. They can't fly. 
And God knows exactly. He's always got his eye on the thermometer and his hand on the thermostat. But he's not in a hurry. He's, he's, he's working on our lives. And we oftentimes want quick responses. And, and we find from the life of David that God didn't do a lot quick. And he probably thought, man, I'm going to get annoyed with all. When am I going to be on the throne? It would, be, it would be decades later that he was on the throne. And God had to do a work inside of him. And God's doing a work inside of you. It doesn't matter who you are, if you're a man or you're a woman, if you're a leader or you're a subject, God is doing a work inside of you. Let him, be, let him do that work. Let him provide that patience that's needed and that discipline and the inner man work that only God can do. We see that in the life of David especially. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for the joy of being with our church family this evening. Thank you for the Bible. Please help us, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.